Coming up on this episode of the Model 3 Owners Club show. We have some Model 3 news for you. Buy the numbers, more deliveries and updates. Yeah, we'll talk about Tesla and some battery improvements they're doing. What is 2018 going to look like to Tesla and the battery electric vehicle marketplace? Yeah, it's going to be interesting. We've got some other manufacturer news as well. Yeah, these stories, including our mailbag. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Coming right up. Well, welcome to this edition of the show. My name is Kenneth Bacor. I'm Trevor Page. This is our first episode of 2018. Happy so th- New Year. Yeah, Happy New Year, everyone. Thanks, Thanks for, for joining us. Stone Man says. Yeah, so I'm what do we think. got on the plate? Well, let's talk right away about some Model 3 news. Um, it's been an interesting start to the year with some numbers that have come out uh, on the deliveries that we were all anticipably waiting for. Uh, and I'm also going to start off by apologizing. I've got a bit of a cold, so if I mm. cough a little bit or sneeze here and there, we're going to try to edit it out. But if, if, <laughs> if one happens to slip through, I'm going to apologize keep for that. your distance so I don't catch it. Okay. It's been a cold spell that we've had up here, as Ooh, you've seen by some of our videos. So it got to me, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, so Q4 calendar year 2017 deliveries. Um, let's talk about that from a Model 3 perspective. So they did, Tesla did 1,550 for the fourth quarter of last year. Mm-hmm. Um, that's not including 860 vehicles that were what they call in transit. So they don't count towards a delivery because they're on a truck or they're in a parking lot somewhere. They're being staged, but they're actually built. Um, so though that 860 will count towards this quarter now in January here of 2018. Um, so they have 1,550 for Q4. Add that to the 222 that they did in Q3 of last year gives you a total of 1,772 delivered Model 3s. Quite a bit short than what we uh, yeah, all had estimated. It's a little bit short that I think that everybody watching and following Tesla and the Model 3s, not only ourselves, but all the other YouTube people and, and analysts and everybody. I know Ben, you know, he, he talked about 80,000 or so that they deliver. We called anywhere from 25 to 45-ish or 40-ish. The mainstream was anywhere from 10 to 50, 60K. So the numbers were all over the place. Um, it's certainly disappointing, and I know we've talked about that. We've used that word before, and people are saying, oh, it's not really that disappointing. Um, I would have liked to see more in the hands of, uh, obviously, of, of uh, re- registrationers um, that are waiting for deliveries. But what's your take? I mean, is it, is it a big surprise? I think for a lot of people, it's, it's, you know, it's depressing. It's like, well, man, I really want my Model 3. What's going to happen? Mm. So they are starting in California. They are slowly starting to make their way east. Right now, it's still current um, Model S or X owners who still get priority. Mm-hmm. They're getting the chance to configure. Mm-hmm. What's also important, too, is... Um, well, we're seeing public deliveries, though. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're going to gonna start, yes, yeah, very, very soon. Mm-hmm. And um, the way that they're doing this right now is... Pretty much what I was told sometime earlier last year um, that I had reported on in one of the videos that I did. Um, uh, however, I was premature because I said that was going to happen in July. But what I was told was that they were going to move to more of an inventory model. Mm. And what I mean by that is right now, the only two things you can choose on a Model 3 is color and your wheels. Mm-hmm. So what Tesla's essentially doing is they're building inventory cars and they're putting them on holding lots. And then when somebody clicks configure, they say, well, we have five of these, go go deliver one next week. Mm-hmm. So that's really what's going on right now. So having said that, because the production ramp is so slow right now and the way that they're delivering the cars, I think it answers one of the common questions I'm getting on social media is, when am I going to see the standard battery? When mm-hmm. am I going to see the standard battery? I think we're going to see the standard battery more towards the summer of this year. They're just There's Agreed, so much yeah. pent-up demand now for this yeah. long-range car. Tesla needs the money. They're still spending money, the capital expenditures. So mm-hmm. I think it's going to be a while before we see cheaper versions of the car. Um, the other question we get, of course, is when are we going to see the white interior? Again, white interior probably towards uh, summertime again. Mm-hmm. Everything's been pushed back yep. almost six months. So still early days. It's disappointing. A lot of us in Canada, of course, were, mm-hmm. were waiting for Model 3. Uh, some of us were hoping in the spring. That didn't happen. We're still seeing late 2018. And I think that's really what's going to happen. It's late 2018. Could even push into sometime in the first quarter of 2019. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised to see 2019 as well. I mean, a lot of predictions for this year, and I think it echoes 
our thoughts as well is that the, I don't think the ramp up will be as, as linear as people are calling it to be. And for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned, you know, there are issues that they can still come across and we'll talk about something that's just occurred uh, recently as well uh, mm -hmm. later on in the show. But, you know, they can have these up and down type of volume issues. They can start pumping out, you know, two, three thousand. All of a sudden they're back to thousand because of some issue or whatever. I don't think that the, the production will, will remain consistent for, for throughout the whole year. Um, and, and I also think that the um, the delivery process could be a bottleneck because they're going to get a, a large number of cars that they've never had before produced. And now they have to deliver these cars. And yes, they're building separate centers in some markets, in the mm -hmm. larger markets to accommodate that. Um, and, and that that should overcome it. But I'm just putting a little bit of concern there that that could be also a bottleneck as well. I find so they may be able to build 10,000 cars yeah. in a month, but delivering them is a different story. Well, uh, in a timely manner. Well, I mean, it's it's kind of common right. knowledge now that Tesla has been doing a lot of the deliveries, say in California, they're doing them at Marina del Rey yep. in a dedicated facility. Yep. Uh, here in Toronto, uh, they use the International Center mm -hmm. because the, our service center in Toronto is just too small, exactly. and there was a lot of push from the four quarters. That can quarters. happen in a lot of markets. It, yeah, so. it will happen in right. a lot of markets yeah. because uh, their current service centers right now cannot handle the influx of Model Three right. deliveries. So as they start moving up the coast and moving towards from west to east, you're are going to see a lot more of these delivery centers being opened up just mm -hmm. to handle the sheer model uh, model yeah. three volume that's coming i also find it interesting too that even though the deliveries have started tesla still hasn't released this material they've been talking about yeah you know the training and the videos it still yeah. hasn't happened yet yeah that's interesting i mean it took them how long to get the owner's manual out right uh you know yeah that took, that took months and, months, and that so. still hasn't been updated yet because it's out of date already <clears throat> so that's right who knows We'll have to keep, but I mean, good thing that there's a lot of videos popping up now of everybody getting deliveries and now <laughs> well, that there's helps. no ban or whatever. If there there's, was no ban, there's no shortage of videos on, on, on YouTube so, right now of owners uh, who tons. have their Model 3s and they can take exactly. you, they can answer a bunch of questions. So There's more yeah. coming out every day. Yeah. So you mentioned about, about their goal for, for this year as far as uh, they, they wanted to set a goal of 5,000 per week. They had moved at from the end of 2017 to the uh, end of March 2018. Mm -hmm. That got moved in the last call now to the end of June of this year uh, of reaching that 5,000 per week threshold for manufacturing. Um, they also said that um, in their last uh, comments a couple weeks ago that in early part of this month, they hit 1,000 a week. So they were able to start hitting that 1,000 a week threshold. So if, if we hypothesize here and just say, let's take an average ramp of, of 2.5 or 2,500 cars per week from January to June uh, over six months, that's about 60,000 cars. They said that they want to hit 5,000 cars per week uh, by July 1st. So if we take 5,000 cars a week for the next six months from July to December, that gives us about 120,000 cars. So that's about 180,000 cars. Um, again, I don't think the ramp up is going to be as linear as they're hoping it's going to be, that, that they still could suffer some issues. I mean, I hope not. I hope they make 300,000 cars. I mean, oh, it's not I'd, I'd love them to satisfy these these large back orders, mm -hmm. but it's not going to happen. And I think what we're trying to do, folks, is just kind of level set and just add a little bit dose of reality here. Um, now, when you look at some of the other analysts that are out there, and one of the things we do behind the scenes is we, we keep our ears plugged to the ground, we read, we talk to people, uh, we get information of what other people are saying, and the average seems to be about 180,000 cars for a prediction this year of Model 3s. Now, Ben Solins uh, from Teslanomics, he's predicting 200,000. He just came out today to say that around 200,000. I think that's optimistic. I personally think it'll be like more than 140 to 150,000. You think it might be a little higher than what I'm thinking. And we're not betting on this. We're just, we're just like, again, we're, <laughs> we're taking a guess. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're just, uh, you know, trying to add our, our knowledge and our sense of what's happened so far um to the tesla you know delivery process and to their manufacturing and what we think might happen for this year yeah i just think that uh you know you just got to look back on tesla's history is that they said that they're going to do this and they always come in under so i yeah. think it's just safe to just say no they're not going to meet these numbers i mean they're still not going to i mean they're not going to build two thousand cars they're going right. to build you know several a lot more. You know, tens of thousands they of these things to. 
And uh, interestingly enough, too, their, their original plan of building half a million cars is nowhere to be mentioned anymore. Yes, I noticed that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, I don't I think that, that that's going to happen. They're, they're going to need to build either another production line, and I don't know where they're going to do it in Fremont because it's so full right now, or I mean, they're just going to have to wait for another factory. The Giga factory. If another, there. They're going to have to do another yeah, factory. That's interesting. So that's what we're thinking from a numbers. And there's a Wall Street article that just came out as well that kind of mimics what we just said. They feel that 2018 will be Tesla's greatest operational challenge in mm. the history of the company and we agree with that uh, that you know they really need to figure out how they're going to produce these hundreds of thousands of Model 3s I mean we're talking a large number of, of back orders for, for lack of better terms reservations that they have for cars that people want you know, in order to hit even the 180K that we just ran through that could happen, they really need to ramp up very quickly. Um, and Tesla is still spending. Don't forget that, folks. They're spending heavily on capital. They they spent, what, over a billion last quarter, oh, their yeah. fiscal quarter? Mm -hmm. And they need to because they're still ramping up and adding, you know, spending money here and there where they have to. And they might have to go to the street again for more funds. So that's not a bad thing. That's just the reality of the things. And that all could come into a timing play. So if they need more money... They have to slow their spending down, get more money, then they start spending again. And that all has that up and down effect. Uh, we also have to remember, and the Wall Street article pointed this out, that there's going to be more serious competition uh, coming out uh, into the battery electric vehicle market more than ever that there ever has been, I think, this year. Mm -hmm. It'll be a great year from that perspective. You've got LEAF 2.0, as we call it, yeah. um, coming out uh, in North America. It's already on sale in other markets. The Jaguar I-Pace, which we've talked about a lot, that'll hit streets and showrooms uh, this year, this calendar year. The Chevy Bolt, I imagine Chevy's going to wake up and start increasing production on that car that they have a lot of people waiting for. Um, and so Tesla really has now, more than ever, I think, in the company's history, except maybe when they were starting, uh, a higher degree of urgency to start delivering cars. Mm -hmm. um, and one thing that the article mentioned, which I thought was really, really a key point, is don't underestimate the challenge that Tesla has to face. They've never had to produce this amount of cars before, not even a fraction of this amount before, uh, that they need to deliver um, in their in their history. And, and they have in the past been struggled to be profitable, even from selling higher price cars. So I'm not bashing them. I think they're, they're, they will be a profitable company. They are at points. They have to spend money right now to make money, but they have to get these cars out there. Um, they need to hit production efficiencies and they need to hit what Elon likes to say, those economies of scale mm -hmm. in order to get the margins up and to get those deliveries out there so that they can make the money and, and reinvest and keep building. I want to make it's a, a critical year for that. Yeah, I want to make a couple of points. And it's important to put this into context. The car is not the problem. Right. Yeah, exactly. The machine that makes the machine, mm -hmm. this this alien dreadnought they've been talking about, this huge amount of automation is mm -hmm. the root of the system. And the other thing, too, is that the economies of scale for the Model 3 is not just the switch to steel and, and doing a new cell and lower cost parts. It's the actual production mechanism itself. It's mm -hmm. the Gigafactory. It's this new uh, f um, uh, production line they've built in Fremont. All of that is taken into context in order to keep the cost down on the car. So for Tesla, it's super critical that they get this machine to work. Yep. And because it's so complex and it's new to them, I mean, yeah. you know, automation's been done before. For them. That's right. Good but point. for Tesla, this is new. I mean, mm -hmm. I've been to the factory and I've seen mm -hmm. how much manual labor is involved in the S and X. And the three is a completely new animal for them. So it's understandable that it's taking them much, much longer to ramp up and get all the bugs worked out of the system. Mm -hmm. But it's critical for them to actually get the bugs worked out on this because it's part of the cost reduction of the Model 3 and it's the path to profitability. Mm -hmm. The nice thing, though, is that if you want to call it the rainbow at the end of the road, is that once they get this thing figured out, they will have gained so much knowledge mm -hmm. so that the second iteration, call it Model Y, or doubling the uh, doubling the capacity for building the Model 3 mm -hmm. will be easier for them because now they've known how to fix all these issues so that now they can basically duplicate it and do for something else. So it's still early days, and, yeah. and this is really the root cause of the whole thing. It's disappointing, but I think Tesla kind of bit off a little bit more than they could chew as far mm -hmm. as their predictions are concerned, not the end goal. 
Totally agree. So it's going to be, you know, you can tell that we're still excited. It's going to be an exciting year for the Model 3. It's still a great car. It's still a great car. Um, fortunately, some of you, are, are, our viewers out there, are now getting a chance to experience the car in either ride-alongs or, or other. We'll talk about that in a sec. So, you, you know, you will see that it's a great car and it's definitely worth waiting for. But we just wanted to kind of level set this year, start the new, the first show of the new year off with some predictions, which most people do, and where we think things are going to go with Tesla. Of course, we'll keep our ear to the ground and all of our sources and, and uh, places that we get information from and continue to report on this as things go. So let's get to some other Model 3 news, uh, some announcements that have come out. Um, warranty info for the Model 3 uh, was released recently. So the Model 3 has a vehicle limited warranty of four years, or which incurs 50,000 miles or 80,000 kilometers. Uh, they also have a powertrain warranty, which is eight years. Now remember, powertrain is batteries and the drivetrain units mm -hmm. uh, in that. So it's eight years or 100,000 miles. 160,000 kilometers for the standard range battery uh, version or 120,000 miles which is 192,000 kilometers for the long range version of the vehicle. So that's that's a great warranty Good, decent, and, and it's yeah. nice to see them continuing on with their with their stellar warranties that uh, that they have in the marketplace. They've also added something different from a Model 3 warranty perspective. They've they've added a guarantee limit of 70% of the battery retention over the warranty period and this is only on the Model 3 where they've done that. Yeah, they've never um, done this before. Yeah, which I found was interesting. I didn't know that they didn't do that uh, before, so that's that's quite I think a bit unique. I think Nissan did that on the Leaf. Uh, they had a threshold for the, the original versions of the Leaf. I think About it was 60% right. or something mm -hmm. like that. So Tesla's saying we're guaranteeing at least 70% retention over eight years. It's important to remember though, this is worst case scenario worst because case, we have right. good evidential information now over the last yeah, five years as they're right. making the S and the X batteries that it far exceeds this. So um, I'm, I'm not worried about the battery no. in the least. Me neither. But it's nice that they're, they're standing behind their warranty. Yep. Well, let's talk about this interior fabric thing that just oh. came up a couple of days ago. Um, they're seeming to mix up their interiors and there's been some reports on new deliveries now, uh, people get in their cars and where the uh, Alcantara interior linings are supposed to be, they've either been there or there's been a mix of that with some textile fabric. Um, what's going on, Trav? Tell us. Oh man, it really blew up over this yeah. one, including myself. <laughs> I'm very disappointed in this latest mm -hmm. move. Um, okay, so here's, here's the nutshell, in case you haven't figured it out yet. Um, every Model 3 uh, that they've been uh, manufacturing since they started production, yeah. up until very, very recently, we've had a few reports of this, yeah. where the interior was Alcantara. Now, mm -hmm. Alcantara is a product, it's a brand name mm -hmm. of uh, artificial suede. Mm -hmm. Now, if you get the premium seats on the S or the X, you get this nice suede material on the roof and the right. B pillars. The basic interior has cloth. Um, Tesla's product uh, photography on the Model 3, all the marketing on the Model 3 mm -hmm. on their website has always shown this Alcantara or artificial suede yep. interior. And we've seen that in the early production cars. Exactly. Too, so. We yep. wrote mm -hmm. in it. We, yep. We've seen it ourselves. It's it's very mm -hmm. nice. Now, I understand there's controversy. Some people like cloth. Other people don't like suede. That's fine. Mm -hmm. The issue here is the fact that they made a switch recently. Um, some people just took delivery and noticed that they had switched the headliner, and I'm sp I'm specifically talking about the headliner itself, not the visors or the B pillars necessarily, right. but there have been some mix-ups right. where some cars were delivered with a cloth headliner and Alcantara visors. So the internet, of course, blew up, and everybody's trying to figure out what was going on, and, mm -hmm. and Tesla put out a statement saying, Quote, as we continue to increase production of Model 3 and produce more high quality cars for customers, all Model 3 vehicles are being made with the same premium textile headliner found in our flagship Model S and Model X vehicles, which has always been planned at this stage of production. End quote. That's new to me. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. <laughs> I don't it. either. So, sorry, folks. I yeah. don't buy it. Yeah. Um, all the production uh, photography has always shown this. Yeah. Um, even though the fact that, you know, it says premium materials throughout in the premium interior, I know it doesn't specifically mention Alcantara. Mm -hmm. But look, when you start making two to 3,000 cars been delivered with this, well, 2,000 cars, right? Because 2, we just talked about that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, with this interior, and then all of a sudden you deliver a car with mismatched materials, that's wrong. Yeah. I'm sorry. Agreed. Now, I think, I mean, there's a lot of theories about this. 
Uh, Obviously, you, some supplier issue. You know, it could be, be a, a simple supplier issue. They yeah. ran out of parts and they just mm -hmm. said, well, just do what you can, throw mm -hmm. it in there and hope the customer doesn't notice or whatever. <laughs> I know for me personally, if I'm spending this much money on a Model 3 and I uh, was showing delivery of this vehicle and a mismatch, yeah. I would put that on a list of fixables. Tesla needs to make this right. Yeah. So if they're going to switch, then do it wholesale. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine any other manufacturer, name them, uh, doing a mismatched material like this and trying to pass it off. I think it's wrong. Yeah. They need to fix this. So if you're going to go to cloth, then go to cloth. Make mm -hmm. everything cloth. Call it a day. Yep. Uh, but don't mix and match materials. It's wrong. Don't Agreed. do this. So we'll I'm keep our, our eye on this. Hopefully, it'll be a sh it just, this is just a short-term issue and that they will, it'll get resolved. Um, I, it doesn't sound like they're going to go back to the all Alcantara interior linings. It sounds like they're going to stick with this premium fabric, textile fabric, as they call it. But uh, we'll wait and see. Well, that's at, what it looks at, like. you know, at the very least, now we know what mm. kind of material is right. going to look like in the base model car. Which, so it's not that bad. No, no, it's yeah. not bad. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not. I'm, I don't have a problem yeah. with the cloth necessarily. Yeah. I have a problem with the mix and match yeah. and the no communications from yeah, Tesla no saying that we're going to yeah. make this change. That wasn't a great. And, pu and putting out a statement like that, I'm sorry, I don't buy it. Agreed. Well, they also came out with some other options that you can now get well-timed options you can get with your Model 3 once you get delivery. And if you need it, you can get some winter tires and rims. They came out with both an 18-inch and a 19-inch version of those. There's an 18-inch pinwheel rim with Pirelli Winter Sot. Toro Zero Series Soto 2. Zero. Soto Zero. There you go. <laughs> series 2 tires. These are 235, 45, 18s for those who really want to know the numbers. A set of those will swing you back about $1,700 US if you have that. Or the 19 inch coming a stiletto rim with Pirelli Winto Soto Zero 3 tires. And they're 235, 40, 19s. And they're about 2,500 US a set for those. So now you can get those. And they've also come, and we've seen, I've seen a picture of those as well, I think on. Uh, uh, on Twitter of somebody that has the uh, Pawag snow chains as well that they've offered as an option. So if you live in those climates uh, where you really need to get better grip, get some snow chains and they're available. Yeah, I think the prices are a little on the high side. Yeah, That's just personal. You can get yeah. aftermarket tires. I highly yeah. recommend for those of you who are interested, uh, to maybe uh, get a, get in touch with a company called Fasco mm -hmm. here in Canada. Um, they were the ones that supplied Yo-Yo uh, Shea. That's right. Uh, with yeah. a set of winter tires when he came through Montreal because mm -hmm. he was in desperate need of some he proper... He was all over, over place. Yes, <laughs> it, yeah. And he said that uh, he saw a huge difference even yeah. with the real wheel drive right. just putting a proper set of snow tires on the car. Yeah. So please, folks, if you're thinking about a Model 3 and you think you need all-wheel drive without snow tires, you're sadly mistaken. Right. You need to put Still proper snow tires. tires on your car. So yeah. anyways, um, we'll put up a little segment behind us here in a few seconds. Mm -hmm. And then you can watch this 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 process that Fasco did with the Oyoshe to see the process of them measuring the tires and put them on the car. Oh, I can't believe he's not slipping. <laughs> The traction control is kicking in, but uh, yeah, yeah, I can feel yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, it's so much more nimble than it is. I mean, it seriously feels like a much more like a, a little GT or a sports car, really. Yeah, but you're also going to have much more predictable grip, like gotcha. that transition phase between when the tire is starting to give up and when it really lets go is much bigger on a snow tire because it has a slower steering response. It's done for a reason like that, right? So that you can you can sort of judge the breakaway. You gotcha. know, it's designed to give you confidence. So even when it's sliding, it feels way more controllable right, than right. the all-season or the summer tire. Right. You know? um, that's what makes them a little bit sloppier in the drive. You know, that's right. the trade-off. The tire has to have a softer construction in order to be able to give more gently on, on slippery surfaces. But this, this particular Falcon, the 449, is I think a beautiful balance between dry road handling and uh, grip on ice and snow. It'll feel softer than the 19-inch summers, but it's not going to feel like crazy soft. Right. Right? What's your website? Uh, the website? Yeah. Uh, fastwheels.ca I have to say, I love the interior. I was really worried when I saw the reveal car. I thought, man, it looks so stark in there. But I was just telling Trevor at, at Model 3 Owners this morning, it's like, it's so much more warm and inviting than, than what it looks like in pictures. You know, you, you kind of figure like, oh man, it's going to look so naked in there. But you don't even realize it's like... Kind of like being in a high-end Swedish living room or something. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. You are at Fasco, home of Fast Wheels, Braylon, and Replica. And we have a special treat for you today. Uh, I'm Ian Mad Hungarian Pavelko, Director of Technical Services here at Fasco. And we have the piece de resistance of the year, the Tesla Model 3. 
brought to us from sunny California by Yo-Yo Shea, our man on the Tesla 3 road trip. Yes. What yes. an incredible project this is. Yes, I mean, it has been. Yeah. I mean, you got to tell us what it's all about. I mean, I've been a Tesla fanatic ever since I heard about the Model 3. You actually got the car. It's the first one I've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, as everyone knows, I'm completely losing it. Yeah. Uh, tell me why why the project? Why the road trip? Like, it's, this is an incredible time-consuming thing. And sure. you're being so generous with your time and racing around at a breakneck pace. Like, what, what's the story, man? Sure, How did yeah, this all yeah. start? Um, well, you know, I'm a Model S owner and um, in California, and I was able to get the Model 3 um, before many people did. And, uh, you know, I thought, uh, why not travel around um, and kind of show people the car? Uh, we weren't really expecting it to be this big. We were expecting maybe meeting two or three people at each stop. But yeah. last night in Montreal, I think we had over 100 people there. Yeah, um, you it, know, so. it's like I told everybody, it was like a small Beatles concert. Yes, it, it was. Like. It was, yeah. I think this thing has more or less taken on a life of its own. But uh, now it's become more or less of a... Uh, almost like a small movement and uh, yeah. a ton of people are coming out you know just checking out the car having a good time and uh, you know participating in this um, in this really large uh, road trip well yeah we, we estimate in Quebec alone it's it's not official this is just back of the envelope calculation mm -hmm. but we think there's something like 6,000 of them on reserve yeah in Quebec yeah. alone yeah not, not surprising yeah. no well no we, we've been really at the forefront of EV movement because sure. you know we have 99% green energy here yeah so yeah, to, to me that. it's kind of crazy that we haven't done it already yeah you know yeah. part of it is waiting for the technology to catch up sure sure and, and, and this is kind of where we're at right now so yeah. uh, man I just can't thank you uh, enough for bringing it by of course of course um, really happy to it's it's fantastic that you're doing this I'm sure everybody across Canada and the rest of the U.S. and then you're moving on I think if I read the schedule right you're going to take this to Hawaii uh possibly uh you know we're, we're still seeing I think we're going to prioritize our European stops first okay. um yeah and uh, we're thinking about taking this car to Europe right after this trip um and uh it'll probably be shipped over and uh you know we'll see what we do with it then well I know you're on a tight schedule I do not want to monopolize a minute more time than no we problem. have to yeah, so let's sure. dig into it we're going to do a full measuring session now with the Model 3 we're going to show you what that's all about get into the internals see what's ticking under the fenders and uh, we will take it from there Just, just to go over it for, so the back is different uh, from the front, huh? Yeah, what you're going to see is the front on the Model S, if you can swivel back for a second, this uses a four-piston monoblock caliper. Okay. So when we measure that, uh, we don't have to worry too much about the tolerances because this basically doesn't move. It's locked in position with, okay. with, the, front, uh, with the front disc. Now, that's a bit unusual. Um, most cars, sort of from the Model 3 class and lower, use what's called a floating caliper, and that's usually a single or double piston, and we'll see that in the back of the car, yeah, yeah. and that actually moves around on a sliding bracket, so it's a little less expensive to build, but it doesn't give you the same kind of clamping force as this big sure. four-piston caliper. Sure. So, uh, and you can see this this is pretty substantial in size, so this yeah. is going to determine which wheels fit and which wheels don't. Got that's it. why, you know, when we do the measurements, we're doing what we call the x-axis, which is across the face of the yeah. caliper, then we do the y across the back. It gives us a 3D map of the entire shape, and then that combined with the PCD or volt pattern plus the diameter of the hub the length of the hub yeah. and then we finally do a, a mapping of the the clearances inside to the upper portion of the control arm okay yeah. and then with all of that compared to the outside fender lip we have everything we need to know to fit the car like a glove every time but it gives us a really high confidence level of precision, especially for the Canadian market, because here what we get asked a lot is, can I put a smaller wheel on the car for winter? Oh, I see. You know, yeah, which yeah, is what yeah. we're right, doing right, here. Right. We're going to go from your 19s down to the 18s. Yeah. A lot of people are asking us, can I put a 17 inch on this car? Well, once we put that data in, we will have that answer. We will be able to tell you for sure. The other thing I should point out is Tesla has already shown in their specifications, there's going to be two different front brake sizes. There's uh, this, which is a 320 front millimeter, and then there's going to be a larger, which I'm going from memory, I think is around 340. 40 or 350 front millimeter. Okay. That's only listed as the uh, as the plus. So I'm thinking that might be the performance front brakes for the okay. performance model okay. of the car. Okay. There. Oh. So so far everything <laughs> we've seen. No, they were so nice and clean. So in the back, because you only really require about. 30% of the braking force in the rear compared to the front, you can get away with a much smaller brake, a much simpler brake. So this is a single piston floating caliper. So there's one piston at the back actuating on the rear rotor. It pushes on one side and then that forces the opposite side here to pull inward. So it's basically doing this 
and it slides on this fixed bracket that you see here. Okay. So this is I a see. lot less expensive to manufacture and maintain. All right, everybody. So YoYo uh, -Yo has done a crowdsourcing from Facebook yes. on the wheel choice. Yes. And the winner is? The black ones, choice A. The Fast Wheels FCO4, our lightweight competition wheel, 18 by eight. Uh, weighing in at only 18.8 uh, pounds. Fully flow formed, very lightweight, very, very strong. Hopefully it's gonna save you some energy, especially on the city cycle. So sure, of course, I think, of course. And it's gonna look awesome. The, the no, black does, contrast against the white and easy to clean. And if it gets a little dirty in winter, not such a big deal. Uh, the perfect. black's gonna camouflage a little bit. So awesome. no, good and call face with people. What are we putting around it? Oh yeah, well now we gotta put some rubber on this, obviously. Uh, so that's already gone off. We've got another full set of these that have gone to the uh, installations department. And we're gonna put some Falcon HS449 high performance V-rated winter rubber. So no more slip and slide. That's well, right. only when you want to. Yes. You, you wanna yes. drift, you can drift. Yeah. And what I like about it is it's a great high speed handling tire. Okay. A lot of winter tires have this kind of, you know, wobbly gobbly yeah, feel yeah, on, right, on the right, highway this right. doesn't it's got a, it's a v-speed rated it's got good high speed handling right. but you'll get way better winter traction cool so let's get them mounted and get them on the car here we go this is number one i think you're going to recognize the pattern i haven't even told you the story behind this the logo on this is actually the motif off my my shirt that i camped out in front of the store for two days yeah yeah yeah, yeah. of the evolution of the car into the model three with the supercharger gotcha, wow. okay. so people kind of went freaky on it and we decided to turn it into a t-shirt really okay great. so i've been doing this as a fundraiser uh -huh. and uh, plug in america um and um lavec in canada yep. which is the association of vehicle electric de quebec uh, as well as Electro Mobility Canada are the three foundations that yeah. are betting from this. We've already raised over two thousand dollars for them. We sold close to four hundred shirts. Wow! Wow! So I'd yeah. like you to have one to take on your travels. Thank you very with much. You. I will. Yeah. You know, yeah. wear it and get wear it in the warmer. Um, yeah. In a warmer. I'm climate. not suggesting yeah. now, but I'm sure. just saying, you know, like. Awesome. Thank you very much. A little much bit, yeah. you know, and, and you. if anybody is interested, you can get that on Teespring, Mad Hungarian on Teespring.com. Sure. And sure. you can find the shirt and. Um, if you can, uh, you know, send me a link to that. Yeah, I'll definitely send you a link for it. You know, if people are interested and they want one. Sure. Staying on the topic of Yo-Yo Shui, as you just saw that video, um, uh, his road trip across North America has been a resounding success. He's not back home yet. I think he's back home in another few days or two a week. Um, but he came by Toronto. We, we did a video in the freezing cold. That's probably oh. where I got my cold from. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was just great to see people come out. And, and the general, you asked the, the people right at the start, what do you think about it? You know, How does it look in person and how does it feel? And everybody was a resounding, oh, it's great. They're really, really happy with the look and feel of the car. Mm -hmm. And having that opportunity to sit in it. And, and uh, he was doing test drives the next day. Uh, I believe you could he sign came up back. Test drive. Um, yeah. I mean, he was he was put behind because he had started yeah. the day in Montreal and he yeah, needed the yeah he flight. needed the new wheels and they had Very to make bad. a stop in Ottawa and they had yeah. supercharge. It, it was supremely cold out, so his supercharge yeah. rate was even slower than he anticipated. Yeah. So by the time he actually arrived, it was about three o'clock yeah. in the morning our time, and it was really cold. Uh, exactly. We still had an okay turnout, but yeah. the next day was even better. We're all crazy. So he made an exception <laughs> and came back the next day, so yeah. everybody in Toronto got a chance to see the yeah. car. So, but it's great for him, and thank you for doing that. I yeah. know He's still he's still doing it, uh, and I think there's plans for him. He wants to go to Europe now and do do it as well. Sure, trip, that so. would be awesome. So um, there was a recent report about a Model Three owner that got into a crash. They were uh, on the road driving at about 45 miles per hour and hit a deer. Um, and the pictures that were put up there, and I think it might have been on Reddit, if I remember seeing that, uh, is that there was really minimal damage to the car. It just looks like, uh, it's hard to tell from the picture that was shown um, where it shows where the damage is, but it looks like more indentations and scuffs versus really bad dings and, and crumpling of the car. Um, there was no injury to any of the vehicle occupants and damage again was very minimal to the frontage area. There was no word on the deer. I didn't couldn't find anything about how the deer made out on that crash, but I'm pretty, we're presume that uh, the deer may not have made it and we're sad for that but mm. uh, uh, at least it shows that the model 3 is uh, uh, has been built and engineered to get a five-star safety rating as what elon had had uh, said at the reveal event way back when and it looks like it's well on its way to getting that and now uh, we talked about yo-yo and what he's giving an opportunity to people to touch feel and, and get into the car well now finally model threes are coming to uh, making their way into tesla showrooms Yay. there's uh, three model threes out there now one of 
of course, is in the Fremont Factory Store. I think that's been out there for a couple of weeks now that you can climb around and see. And uh, there's two more stores in California that have Model 3s in the showroom, the Century City Mall in L.A., which is a great place. I've been there. And the Sanford Shopping Center in Palo Alto. So uh, if you're in those areas, um, go check them out. This is your opportunity to touch, feel, get a sense of, hey, I'm six foot four. How am I going to fit in the car? And Spec some crowds. Uh, <laughs> I've got three baby seats to put in there. How is that going to work? Can I put a, Can I really put a surfboard in there? Let's check it out. Oh, right? surfboard. Yeah, Take your surfboard it. in. Yeah. I challenge a viewer. Take your surfboard in, put it in there and video it and send we, it we to us. We want footage of we'll that. We'll put it on the show. There you go. <laughs> I've thrown it out there. But it is a great sign to see that uh, Model 3 is now sh uh, turning up in stores where they need to be so people can see them up close. Yeah. It's important to remember, folks, that they're mostly doing a lot of deliveries in California. Yeah. So we expect this to start happening as they move mm -hmm. east. Um, as they yep. start doing more and more public deliveries, uh, you should be able to see them in the showrooms over the next six months or so. Yeah, and that's good. I mean, it, it'll be it'll be good for people to see that. I think the only negative there is that it's going to increase sales. They're going to get more people that <laughs> fall in love with the car, and I'm going to put an order in, so yeah. their back orders are going to go up. I would not. not I'll, a bad I'll, I'll mention this though too. Yeah. I, I would not be surprised if Tesla gets an influx of so many people that they may end up having to switch to some kind of reservation system. Mm -hmm. Saying mm -hmm. like, take a number, come in at an appointment to, to yeah, look at the car. Because these things are going to get mobbed. They're going to get mobbed. Yeah, for sure. And we, no indication of when we'll see anything up here in Toronto, in Canada, or Montreal. But stay tuned if we hear something. Uh, we'll, some viewer will probably tell us anyway. Hey, I just saw at Yorkdale or something. You know, who knows? Mm -hmm. We'll find out. Uh, now, Tesla came out with some software updates and added uh, the battery preheating feature. And that's a great topic to talk about, specifically in these in these Arctic uh, chills that we've had recently in North America. Uh, maybe, Trevor, you can explain how that works. Well, what they did is they added a new software update to uh, to the whole fleet, including the Model 3, yeah. where you could... Uh, see, in the past, you could turn on, on the app on your phone, for example, and you could go into the Tesla app and turn on the HVAC system, mm -hmm. which would start heating the cabin. And Tesla had a special system in there where it would actually preheat the battery to a certain degree, whatever the case may be. This new software update now actually um, actively turns on the battery preheater mm -hmm. and actually pulls more power from the grid. And I tested this on my car, either through the UMC or my wall connector, where even at a uh, at a full charge, let's say I call it 90%, the car's no longer charging. And when I turn on the preheater, it's pulling energy from the grid rather than the battery pack. Mm -hmm. So that means yep. that when I preheat the car, preheat the battery pack, I am not sapping range out of the battery pack um, you know, right. and reducing my range kind of artificially or unnecessarily. So mm -hmm. it's nice to see this. Um, I do recommend that you plug in your car when you're not using it, especially in the frigid temperatures, mm -hmm. because it can actively pull energy. Mm -hmm. um, just to give you an example, I was seeing in this really, really cold weather with my car living outside, even though I was plugged in, not charging, I was seeing, um, oh, specifically if I was not plugged in, that I was seeing anywhere from one and a half to 3% range loss per hour. Mm -hmm. It is brutal in the brutal cold. Right. Now I'm talking minus 20 cent, uh, Celsius. I, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Mm -hmm. uh, but, so when it's really, really cold, uh, I saw a precipitous drop in yep. the in the range of the car because the battery pack was was super cold. Mm -hmm. So it's important to keep the battery warm. Now that the temperatures are elevated, now I haven't seen that kind of loss. It's been right. like one or one percent yeah. a day. Yeah. So it's back to normal now. So just keep that in mind. If mm -hmm. you live in a cold temperature or you have your car sitting outside, whatever, make sure you leave it plugged in. Use the preheating before you leave, mm -hmm. half an hour to uh, an, uh, an hour, whatever, mm -hmm. it, depending on the cold, of course. Yep. It doesn't need necessarily that much if, if it's not very cold outside. Mm -hmm. But get the battery pack warm because if you don't, the other thing I've noticed too is when you go to supercharge. If you're in desperate need of a supercharge and a cold battery, those two things don't mix. You get yeah. a very slow charge. Very so slowly. a warm battery mm -hmm. pack is a happy battery pack. And Yo-Yo experienced that a little bit. This is well. one of the reasons yeah. why he was yeah, delayed he was coming late. to Toronto yeah. because it was so cold that when he hit the supercharger, it was slow. It was really slow. So you had to wait. Yeah, yeah. There you go. And as a note, that requires vehicle software version 2017.50 or above, or above, according yeah. to the note. So let's expand our news uh, to a little bit around the global, uh, talking about Tesla. Uh, I want to bring this up because uh, over the Christmas break, I was in Europe with my family, um, both in the UK and in Germany. And it's interesting, when I was in Germany, this magazine that we're showing you behind us uh, from Auto Build, a uh, German magazine, uh, and I saw that article, what Tesla scandal, what's all this about? And I was talking to my family about it. Um, so it seems that there's, there's a lot of hubbub about um, uh, that Tesla was a 
accused of gaming the, the system in Germany regarding the German incentives for EVs. Um, and that article, the way it was written and the way it, it portrayed it, wasn't really factual to that, uh, to that point. Um, the Germans have an incentive uh, for electric vehicles. You can get a 4,000 euro discount off of an EV, um, but that the starting price of that has to be less than 60,000 euro. So, mm -hmm. it's, so it's similar to what we have in Ontario or had or might come again, who knows, on our sliding scale of, of uh, mm -hmm. incentives. Um, now, Tesla had claimed that the cap was too low for, for their model to fit under, um, which is the 60,000 euro. So what they do is they unbundled a lot of the common options that they sell as a bundle in order to meet that pricing point, mm -hmm. enabled it for to enable um, purchasers to get to get that discount uh, off the car, um, and the and they are com complaining that the low cap was fixed by the German government and automakers to exclude Tesla from mm. from uh, taking advantage of that. Now we can't comment if that's true or not. We're not here to do that. That's just what Tesla's claiming. Um, but it just seemed that the, that magazine was skewered a bit by stating that you, you that you couldn't purchase a Model S. Um, at all, and that Tesla was trying to to uh, game the system to get around that, but it's not true. So, uh, but even after all that, though, it appears that Tesla is not uh, on the list anymore. They're now off the list of el eligible EVs for the incentive. So I mm -hmm. don't 100% know what's going on in Germany and why there's this battle with Tesla. Um, we can all make assumptions, but I just I thought I'd point this out. Um, it was interesting when I was in country, and then I had some people. Uh, that know that we do the show and that mm -hmm. we're following this ask me all about it and i'm going well tesla doesn't they don't work that way so that doesn't seem right that they would try to do anything underhanded to uh, to work the system and uh, just wanted to explain what happened there so if any of our uh, german viewers have any more information to share on that please send us an email we'd love to, to get an update mm -hmm. on that um, Tesla in 2018. So we talked about some number predictions for the Model 3s, but uh, as, as a whole, Tesla is going to have a really good year. Again, we, we will see continued increase in production for Model 3s. We'll see more options like all-wheel drive and the lower base battery config options hit the market. Mm -hmm. um, the S and X, um, I think, uh, or we think that they may come out with more refinements and updates to performance and luxury. Of those cars and i think that that's a reason to actually extend the gap between the s and the x oh, and the three especially the s and the three yeah right elon's already said the three is not a small s right they are different cars they're going to be priced differently and they, they go after different people uh, different marketplaces uh the model y do you think that might be unveiled this year yeah i would suspect we'll probably get a good glimpse at the model y maybe sometime in the third or fourth quarter yeah. uh, towards the end okay. of this year so now it doesn't mean it's going to be available in own tesla fashion hold your money folks <laughs> yeah hold on your money we are not going to see model yeah. y for probably two maybe three maybe even four years yeah, um I agree. It, the thing is is that they are at full capacity in fremont they can't make any more cars they there. can't yeah. Uh, so Model Y is going to need a new factory. Elon's even alluded to that. They have not made any announcements right. as far as any more gigafactories, even though they said that they would by the end yep. of 2017. Mm -hmm. Hasn't happened yet. Mm -hmm. So they've got their plate full. So uh, yeah. for those of you who are like thinking that I'm going to buy a Model Y in a year, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So hold on to that for a yep. little longer. Uh, improvements on autopilot should continue to happen, oh, of yes. course, as they as they as AP2 becomes better and, and more efficient there. And uh, continuing with the supercharger and destination charger expansion, they're a little behind their forecast for those for last year. Again, they've got they've got to build Model 3s. They've got to build these cars and get them out. That's their bread and butter. So um, I'm not that surprised that they're a little behind. But we will we will see continued expansion in those um, uh, in those technologies as well. Uh, and on the charging infrastructure, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to our one of our, our small provinces here in Canada. I was going to say is it's the smallest province. I, I believe it's the smallest it province. Uh, Prince Edward Island. It's our only island province. Uh, well, Labrador, I guess, is a little part of is an island. I'm going to get all this New email now. Newfoundland. Out. Newfoundland. Lab yeah, but Labrador is it? I don't know. No. But PEI, um, that they're increasing their charging infrastructure. They currently have 20 level two chargers. So that tells you how big the province is. It's not that big, but it's a great, beautiful province. Been there many times. Love it. But they're adding an additional six high-speed chargers now. They've just uh, filed for some government funding to get uh, six high-speed chargers by 2019. And on top of that, you had read a story that from a Canadian perspective, that there's more funding coming for charging as well 
know, yeah, across the, Canada. The federal government mm-hmm. has just uh, opened up the coffers and are dumping $120 million to build nice. fast chargers all over the country. Great. Now, these will be Chatham OCCS, yep. not Tesla. Mm-hmm. Tesla's doing their own thing. Yep. But it just it just shows that, uh, you know, our government, even now at the federal level, is actually starting to step in now. Yep. So that bodes well, I think, for electrification. They yep. have a goal. They want to get more into Canada. So this is the first step. Yeah. And yep. we've been reporting on all the other countries and jurisdictions doing that as well, adding more charging infrastructure so over the you know this is this is where the hockey sticks happening yep, as well as in starting. the infrastructure right everybody's getting into that and yep. it'll be in the next five years it'll be more, as predominant as almost gas stations are at some mm-hmm. point in time that you'll see a lot of them and in 2018 you know from the rest of the battery electric vehicle marketplace because that's where we kind of focus our attention on it's going to i think it's going to be one of the best years for adoption of battery electric vehicles because of the number of uh, models and, and brands that are coming out this year that are actually going to hit the streets so we mentioned earlier about the nissan leaf that it's already out of and, and that's version one that's the 40 kilowatt version okay. i call it version one of, of leaf 2.0 um, but that should hit the americas soon uh, i think early spring uh, it's yep. coming up and that includes Canada and the U.S. into that. The Jaguar I-Pace, which we've talked about many times, I think that's going to be a really good car. I'm excited about that car. A little um, higher end, though. It, but... It's going to be higher end. I yeah. think it's going to be Model S pricing, maybe mm-hmm. between S and the X. I think they said 75000 U.S. starting US to price. Start? Okay, yeah. so that's in line with that. Mm-hmm. But that should be hitting, you know, you should be able to buy one and get delivery of it this year at some point in time. Um, Audi with their e-tron Quattro model, that will be deliverable this year. Uh, the first of their two models and the Kia Nero and the Hyundai Kona which we've talked about before those are hitting the streets as well yeah and we're going to see um, more from uh, Volkswagen Mercedes yeah. and and, uh, and and BMW in the next yeah. two to three years but mostly in the next two years so. yeah I know VW group is more 2020-ish yeah. but they're they're they keep plugging the IDs and all this stuff yep. so they're, they're, be interesting they're going crazy and we hope to get to the Toronto Auto Show as well and see what's out on the, going to be out on the floor it's there. definitely so, on the uh, map so watch for list, an episode so. uh, that'll be next yeah, month yeah we do that uh, and Toyota. Well, finally, Toyota has come out and said, uh, okay, well, we, we think the electric vehicle is an important thing. Mm-hmm. And we've got all these expansion plans now to include 10 new battery electric only vehicle models uh, and, and eventually all of their models to be electrified in some form or fashion, either plug-in hybrid or, or, or something else. Um, they're going to launch a whole bunch of battery electric vehicles in the early 2020s. There were no firm dates or or. Um, names of the models or ranges or anything and they're going to start in China and then get into uh, Japan, India, USA and then other markets after that um, it's, a, it's a great step for you know for continuing to push EV adoption so we're all for that uh, Toyota however you're late coming to the game on that uh, I think you're you're still relying a lot on depending on the hybrid and that Prius to get you by hybrids are a stopgap folks they're good i know a lot of people love them uh almost every city now has prius plug-in uh hybrid taxi cabs that's the big thing now you you travel around but they're a stopgap they still have an emission generating motor and at some point we need to get rid of that too so props props to them for for perfecting the 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 hybrid thing but it's, it's, it's time to move on but time to move on so it's good to see that at least they're talking about it hey so that's it for for news that we have for the show it's uh mailbag time mailbag awesome well, what do we have on Well, tap? we've got a, a lot of mailbag. Thanks for, wow. I guess, over the holidays, people had nothing to do, so they sent us a whack of emails. <laughs> so we picked a few here. Um, and thank you of that. We always enjoy your emails. So we have a question from Scott from Georgia, from Fayetteville, Georgia, actually. And Scott writes, um, what is the charge rate at a supercharger? And you were just talking a little bit about mm. the effects of cold there. So what's the charge rate at a supercharger when the rate of charge drops significantly to top off the rest of the battery? So once you once it's hit the threshold that you've programmed, what does that charge rate drop off to? Because we know it slows down quite a lot. Yeah, it does. Once you mm-hmm. hit about seventy-five to eighty percent, it tends to drop off. Uh, mainly, I mean, the best the best way to explain uh, charging a battery uh, mm-hmm. at those speeds is to is to look at a glass of water, right? Mm-hmm. So Hopefully imagine you this is that. your battery. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So as you fill up, you can fill up the water very, very quickly. But when you get up to the top, you got to back off on that flow rate. Otherwise, it'll overflow. There's a lot of factors that affect your charge rate mm-hmm. at a supercharger. Yep. Uh, things like your state of your existing state of charge. Like if you start, you plug in a supercharger and let's say you have a 60% uh, charge already, it's not going to be fast. Whereas starting with, say, 10%. The other mm-hmm. thing, too, that, that matters True. is the temperature of the battery pack. If your battery pack's really cold, Which it can't accept a high charge. That's right. So I plugged into a supercharger the first time. It was really cold. I had range mode turned on, which meant the battery pack was cold, and I was getting 24 kilowatt. I mean, mm-hmm. that's 
that's I mean it's a little bit more than double when I get at home but that's still pretty slow if you're going yeah. on a long trip so the warmer the battery pack the lower yeah. rate of charge the faster it's going to charge until you get to that upper threshold mm -hmm. of 75 and mm -hmm. 80. Now, I do know that the Tesla software, the navigation system, so if you type in a destination and it does route you through one of the superchargers, it does take into account um, the amount of time that you need to charge in order for you to reach the next destination. So it's not like it's gonna say, start here, charge to 100% because you only need to go another 30 miles. That's not the way it works. Right. It basically will tell you, stop at this charger for as long as you need for me to calculate to get to the next spot. Mm -hmm. So that charge might only be 50%. It might be 80%. It might be anything in there. Mm -hmm. So the, the routing system on there does a pretty good job mm -hmm. of getting you to the next uh, hopscotch, but you have mm -hmm. to also build yourself in a little bit of buffer too mm -hmm. because of you know variations. So um, I'll have more data on this as we as as we ha have more time with the car, and yeah. I'll be able to report on that. But yes, you have to keep that in mind that once you get to a higher state of charge, it will start backing off. But the trip computer does a yep. fairly good job of, mm -hmm. of estimating, and also to eat them the most out of you know usable long range miles as scott was asking you have to keep your speeds down you notice a difference when you go over 110 kilometers an hour oh yeah it drops off your your consumption drops off yeah. you know, a lot it starts yeah. it starts to really pick up so yeah. uh, i think a lot of that has you know. to do with aerodynamics <clears throat> yep. right because you know the the faster you go through the air the more air resistance mm -hmm. so that's not so much and, and because of that you're expending more energy to break right. through that so if you back off and all it takes is five kilometers yeah. i mean that's what two and a half I miles per hour to hear that. yeah, that that's all you difference. need yeah. yeah so if you need to get somewhere yeah. and it's a little bit iffy whatever just back it off five yeah. that's all it takes it doesn't take much so thanks scott from georgia for that uh, those questions Good questions we've got tim who lives near washington dc in the u.s he's asking a couple questions first of all do we think the roadster and the semi will be allowed to go to market without mirrors absolutely not nope not in north america anyway nope <laughs> nope that's uh i can't i know there's a lot of future concept cars that want to put um, cameras instead of mirrors they did it on the model way. x in 2012 yeah. and we that's still right. have mirrors that's right so it's not happening not going to happen and uh, when it comes to servicing tesla vehicles um are there any restrictions uh, that require that tesla services the vehicle only and i my comment on that um Tim, is that, well, if, I mean, if anything within warranty obviously needs to be done through Tesla. Oh, yes. And I think if you want to maintain warranty status, it needs to be done through Tesla, which is like most of the manufacturers. Some things like rotating tires or something basic like that, you could do yourself or go somewhere else. But um, there's not a lot of servicing anyway that needs to be done. Well, right? it depends on what you consider as <clears throat> servicing. I mean, uh, one of our YouTube friends there, Rich, who goes by the name of Car Guru, has a great YouTube channel where he's rebuilt several Model yeah. S's. He knows those cars very very well and uh, unless you're doing something specific with the battery pack which is a sealed device there's right. not much uh, I mean you can't touch the battery yeah uh, 400 volts will kill you uh, but most of the other stuff in the car can be fairly easily repaired I yep. mean just by swapping out parts and so on and so yep. forth but it's under warranty you got to go to Tesla there's no yep. if you know there's no two ways about it and we talked about their great warranty before so uh, and the, with their 724 roadside as well that they mm -hmm. throw into that but thanks for the questions Tim We've got Tom from Colorado uh, in the States. Uh, he's asking um, regarding the auto park feature, does it work in reverse auto park? Uh, yes. The Okay, so you have to remember the auto park feature or the park assist is part of enhanced autopilot, mm -hmm. so you have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. And it gives you automatic perpendicular and parallel parking. So, you know, if you're driving past the parking spaces, you just watch on your screen, either on the center screen on the Model 3 or on the um, instrument cluster mm -hmm. on, a, on an S or an X, that once it finds a measured uh, parking space that it deems that it can park into, you get a symbol, you, put, you stop, put the car into reverse, and you, and you initiate the park sequence on the screen, and it will park. I've used it a few times. It works, works uh, fairly well, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's not as slow as the Nissan one? In well, it's slower <laughs> than me doing it, but yeah. with such a big car, I kind of, you know... It's I, doing I like, a lot of ch it, safety it's, checks. Yeah, right? I've had one right? instance okay. where it stopped mm -hmm. because uh, it just detected an obstacle. Or I think, if I remember correctly, the manual says if it's more than seven steps, it'll stop. Oh, okay. Right? Mm -hmm. But so far, it's been it's been pretty good for the times that I've used it. Good. So, Great. Yeah. Well, thanks for that question. Um, we've got a question from Rich in Southern California. And this is all about Cirrus uh, XM. And I know there's a lot of us that love oh, yeah. listening. I, I listen to satellite radio all the time. Um, and he's got a bunch of questions about whether that'll work in the Model 3. Uh, will it work, you know, if you have the app running on your phone? 
uh, or it could be a slacker or something else. Can you Bluetooth stream that to, to the Model 3 entertainment system and, and have it come out? So, yes, the Model 3 does support Bluetooth streaming. So I know on an iOS device, because that's what I have, mm-hmm. um, if an iOS device is paired with a Bluetooth device, um, any audio that comes out of the phone itself through the operating system can be streamed uh, over okay. Bluetooth or whatever device. So if you don't have iOS, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it's been several years since I've had an Android phone. But uh, yeah, if you can stream something over Bluetooth, you can get into the audio right. system. And that should also work, Rich, for your second question. If you've, Has anyone tried to connect one of the Sirius XM receivers with the optional Bluetooth interface? Again, the same principle applies. If you have something that, that can stream over Bluetooth and connect, it should work in theory. But if there are any uh, owners that have their cars that uh, have tried some of this stuff that want to send us an email um, and answer that for us, or maybe send us a short video showing us what they've done, we can certainly t- tell folks about that. Rich also asked about the antenna for the X, uh, Sirius XM receiver. Uh, can it be placed on the dashboard or the overhead glass inside or out? I can comment on that personally because in, in my Nissan that I have, I just put in a Sirius uh, XM receiver aftermarket and I just have the antenna in the back, uh, behind the back seat in oh, okay. that uh, shelf there inside, sure. uh, right at the back of the base of the, of the rear windshield. And it uh, 99% of the time, I, I always have signal. Mm-hmm. So it works really well. So you don't necessarily have to mount it outside and stick it uh, on stuff. Um, and it should be able to work underneath your front dash as well, front class as well. So that, that's pretty straightforward. Okay. I, I just want to make one more point here yeah. because I know that people are going to ask, is Android Auto or Apple uh, CarPlay, CarPlay supported yeah. in the Teslas? The yeah. answer is no. no. Mm-hmm. And I've, I've tried it. Um, even though I have the car connection kit in my car, it gives me uh, a lightning port and I plug my phone in, but all it does is charge the phone. There is no interface it does not bring up like I used to have a Kia and if I did that right. I would be able to get the audio uh, you know browsing mm-hmm. function mm-hmm. on the screen there's none of that stuff in mm-hmm. the Tesla so if I want to have something streaming from my phone I have to use Bluetooth but I have one of those little tiny thumbnail thumb drive USB things yep. and I've just copied a whole pile of mp3s I think it's like 120 gigabytes or something like that and I've just copied all my music yep. onto that and I leave that permanently plugged into the yep. car and I can navigate that by going into the, the yeah. system, pulling up whatever song. And that I works want. well. We showed that on our. But I'll be um, honest. Most of the video. time, mm-hmm. I use the streaming audio. I yeah. just I want to it listen to a well. song, and I just say play the song, and it, and it works nice. wonderful. So Excellent. that's my preferred method. But podcasts and stuff, they go through my phone. There you go. Well, thanks, Rich, for those questions. Uh, we have Pedro from Portugal, and he writes a couple of questions. Uh, do we think that the Tesla network will be able to fight against companies like Uber and Waymo? Um, well, I don't think Tesla's there yet. No, no. Network. It'd be several more they're, years. They're kind of in a different marketplace yeah. right now. So who knows? We'll wait and see on that. And then he he, he also talks about when Tesla starts producing 5,000 cars a week, that's a maximum of 30 cars per hour in a day in just one factory. Talks about all the semis and, and that have to carry all those and deliver those. Um, do they already have the team and infrastructure to deal with this madness? And as we kind of commented earlier, that the madness is just starting for them. So yeah. I don't think they have the delivery team and people in place yet to, to really handle 5,000 cars a week, nor are they at 5,000 cars a week anyway. What I was told, however, because mm-hmm. um, if you watch my delivery video, my, my, my yep. great guy, Tim, I yep. ran into him yesterday at a Tesla store <clears throat> and we had a good chat about stuff. And he did tell us that they learned a lot from the uh, fourth quarter delivery where they did okay. the deliveries in, yep. in Toronto by the airport. They learned a lot from mm-hmm. that and they will be using that experience to refine their deliveries more for when the cars actually start showing up. So, um, you know, they're learning as they they're go, yeah. uh, but Good. right, it's still early days. So. Exactly. And our last question from uh, Mark in uh, Lima, Ohio. Um, he writes that uh, he knows that virtually all batteries are toxic and he's wondering what Tesla is doing to address the toxicity when the battery is finally at its end of life. Mm. Um, I, I believe Tesla has a recycling program. Um, they haven't. There hasn't really been any vehicles that have re- reached end of life yet because they're still too early. So there's, there's two parts mm-hmm. to this. Uh, I know what, what Tesla has publicly stated that they do plan on having a recycling mm-hmm. facility at the Gigafactory mm-hmm. for right. batteries that do come in uh, yep. end of life to be recycled. They, mm-hmm. They've said something like 96% of the battery is recyclable. Mm-hmm. Um, there are batteries that people have purchased from crashed vehicles right. where they have been opened and the battery modules in there have been repurposed. Mm-hmm. Uh, for other projects like make your own you know power wall or whatever mm-hmm. other true, yeah. system yeah. Um, and the 
But as far as the cells are concerned, I've seen damaged cells before, and I don't know at what point they're, mm -hmm. they're recyclable. I have actually taken one of these apart myself. I mean, it's just a jelly roll inside. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, how much is toxic? I don't know. I, it's, you know. I wouldn't go out of my way to eat one. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, um, yeah I, I understand it's a concern and stuff, but mm -hmm. it's, 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 yep. um, it's something that remains to be seen. But Tesla, I do have, think that you do have plans for when the time comes. Um, and that's all we really know at this point. So, but it's a good question. Good question. So thanks, Mark, for that question. For everybody for sending in their questions to the mailbag. We appreciate them. And uh, gee, that's almost it for the show. I mean, should we talk about EV Annex? Our yes, absolutely. Yeah. So just mm -hmm. to remind everyone, if you didn't uh, check it out before, this really great book called Getting Ready for Model 3. It's uh, written by Roger Pressman at EvanX, our good uh, sponsors mm -hmm. here. And uh, great book. And you can buy it online at their site at evanx.com. Don't forget, when you put it in your shopping cart, click the little checkbox that says add a license plate frame for the Getting Ready to Model 3 license plate frame. And if you use this code called GR4M3, that's Get Ready for Model 3 during the checkup process, you get the license plate frame for free. Just pay for shipping and handling. Yeah. So thanks for that. Really great, guys. And uh, yeah, we'll be hearing a lot more from Evanex very soon. I'm going on vacation uh, next month, and I plan on stopping into their shop and talking to the guys and yeah. see what their plans are. We do yeah. know that they're working They'll have on a lot of plans. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are working on some stuff for Model yep. 3. So as soon as I have that information, I'll, we'll let you know what's going on. Yeah. So thanks for Evanex for the promotion. Absolutely. And that's it for the show. So there's many ways that you can contact us. We, we talked about mailbag, and the, that's the best way. You can email us at uh, m3ocshow at gmail.com. Yeah, and you can also reach us on Twitter. My handle is at Model3Owners. And I'm at Kenneth Bocor, but he's more important, so he's got more people. <laughs> uh, follow him, and you'll get me eventually as well. Also, website, we've got the Model3OwnersClub.com uh, forum and website. And yeah, we're also on uh, on Facebook, and the uh, the group is called Model3Owners Club. Just Google it, and then uh, you can uh, join the uh, Facebook uh, page on there. And uh, don't forget to like and subscribe and uh, click the notification icon on our YouTube channel. We appreciate all of our subscribers, and that way you get instant notification anytime we put out a new video. And lastly, don't forget about our Patreon mm -hmm. page, and you can check yeah. us out at patreon.com forward slash Model 3 Owners Club. All of the pledges go a long way to keeping the show running, yeah. so we really appreciate all of our very Patreon so. producers. Thank you yes. very much. Thank you for all that. And that's a wrap. Another show is in the can. That's right. So and we'll catch you on the next one, until folks. Until next time, we'll see you then. Thanks a lot for watching. See you. All right. Bye-bye.